happen where where you're living, and uh, do that across across religious difference and you know organisational difference and all the rest of it, because that can be very influential. So the final presentation I'm going to give today, and I apologise in advance because I'm going to rush off after this because I've got to drive back tonight. I've got something on in Hastings tomorrow, and uh, I need to get back for that. So I'm going to sort of be a rather rapid departure because I want to get out before it gets too late. But uh, we're going to look at the cause and resolution of conflict. So inevitably, again, this can't be a comprehensive explanation, but it'll touch on some points rooted in uh, universal principles, which I hope you'll find stimulating and will provoke discussion and, and thought for you all. So I want to look at some sort of root cause, you know, fundamentally where is, where is conflict coming from, and it will be connected to what we've been talking about as uh, the, the basis for true relationships or, or true love, and how that gets violated. So um, I think Robin used this diagram uh, in his presentation about living for the sake of others. So uh, again, I didn't get too much into this theme, um, except in the pair system, as it were, where each partner has to live for the sake of the other, and then they can have good give and take, or good giving and receiving and responding relationships. But fundamentally, when you connect your interpersonal relationships or your relationship with things with the higher purpose, what happens is that you as an individual don't just see yourself living for your own benefit, or even don't just see yourself living for the benefit of your husband, your wife, your children, your immediate family, but you place all those things com in the context of living for a larger purpose, which in its biggest sense you might living you might say living for the sake of the Creator or the Creator's purpose, or to put it another way, living for the sake of the universe or, or humanity at large or, or the betterment of society at large. And you see your life in that frame or in that context. So you're never doing something just for me, and you're not even doing something just for the other one that I'm relating to, but it's, it's rooted in a higher purpose which ultimately connects everybody and everything. So, you know, we say the individuals should live for the sake of the whole. And when we're, you know, when we're at those crucial points in life where we're making decisions of, about what do I do and how do I conduct myself, what sort of frame do we place the decision making in? We try and think, you know, what would be pleasing to God or what would be of benefit to humanity at large or what would be significant not just for myself but for my yeah. wife and my kids and my extended family. We try and place the decisions in the, in the widest context, not just what's suitable for me, what's convenient for me. And of course the, the people we admire tend to be people who are thinking in such a way. Right. So you know we were amazed when we had this, you know, Malala, this young woman from Pakistan who got shot in the face. We were amazed when she's saying things and you know, they seem so global, so incredibly big for a young woman and we're, wow, extraordinary. <laughs> or, or when we think about people that we admire in, in, our, in our national or cultural or religious history. Inevitably there are such people, but what does that mean? It means it leads you to, to make difficult decisions. I think, of, for example, recently we've had uh, news of Myanmar, haven't we, or Burma. Oh, yeah. and the election there, yeah. and so Aung San Chi, who uh, just got I elected. So um, I don't know how, how smoothly that's going to all run. It's not, it's not, not simple not, by not, any no, means. No, no, no. But actually, she's got an interesting life story. I don't, I don't know it in great depth of detail. But you may know that she married an Englishman yeah. who ended up dying of cancer. Um, and she couldn't come back. Well, that's right. She, she went back to Burma because her... Her father had been one of the crucial people in, in Burma's independence. And for love of her nation, she went back to her country, leaving her husband and her kids in England. Oh, what a and then she made a commitment to the future of her own nation. But she knew if she left Burma to go back and visit her husband, who was diagnosed with cancer and going to die, she wouldn't be able to get back into Burma. So she made the very painful decision not to go back to her dying husband and her kids. Because if she did, she'd be abandoning her people and her country. It's what a sacrifice. Golly, what a tough decision. So, you know, it, it, when you place yourself in this context, it's not, it's not easy stuff. You know, necessarily. 
it can often bring you to make a very challenging decision, but which is in accordance with what's good for God, or good for your moral standard, or good for humanity at large. And ultimately, if you make those sorts of decisions, the world moves in a, in a better direction. But as I said, many times when we find ourselves in painful or difficult circumstance, unfortunately, without the guidance of a moral code, you find yourself moving in away. Away from something that's going to make the world a better place, and you know, through cynicism or hurt or pain or you know, vindictive feelings, you know, moving in the wrong direction. So, this would be an expression of the ideal, where every individual lives for the sake of, we would say, God and others, or higher purpose in others. And then, of course, if people all lived that way, what would it mean? It would mean we would live in a society where we would be an awful lot happier. So, you know, if, if you're out driving, if everybody was properly obeying the, the law of the road and behaving very kindly and properly to one another and keeping all the proper standards, our safety would be hugely enhanced. Right? Yes. We would drive much more safely and we'd have a lot less deaths on the road or serious accidents or injuries or whatever. So, so if you behave in such a fashion, then actually you end up living in a society that that brings back benefit to you. Of course, it doesn't mean that all the saintly, holy people in human history got good back for their good conduct, because unfortunately, the world is a very messed up place. But one thing's for sure, they had, to, they, they had the benefit in their heart and their soul, mm -hmm. even if they didn't have it always in the way that they were treated. And many great human beings ended up being killed by people who didn't like their goodness. But, um, Anyway, you understand this type of point. Mm. So if, that, if that's representing um, the core essence of a sort of moral code of conduct, not living for myself, but for living for the sake of a higher purpose or God and other people, um, having said that, we live in a world which is very different from that. And these are just a few images, you know, on a, on a domestic level, domestic violence type of level, on a, on a gang level, you know, on a on a civil war level, I think this is a American civil war picture, I can't remember what it is, it's a civil war situation, and this is a global level, you know, clash of civilizations as some people would put it. This is a, you know, Iraq war, you know, American servicemen in conflicts there on all sorts of different levels and happening in our world right now, and it's very painful to see and very difficult to understand how to resolve it. And of course, UPF doesn't have some you know, instantaneous answers, but it's drawing upon religious understanding and insight and a universal understanding about universal principles to try and give some pointers or some help to be able to feel some hope and some way forward in the circumstance. So, in essence then, what's the cause of, the, of conflict? It's where you turn that principle on its head and where instead of you know, relating to God and higher purpose and making that understanding the basis for all your interpersonal and life, you know, interactions and relationships, where actually you put yourself at the center of everything. You don't live for a higher purpose, but you live in a self-centered way. You think that everything else exists for your benefit, and therefore, consequently, you diminish the value of the whole. Because, you know, you might imagine that by pursuing your selfish interest, you would get benefit. But actually, in the end, you end up destroying other people, destroying the world around you, and getting a lot of damage yourself as a result of that. But, you know, we, we, we don't realize that when we're doing it, of course. But that's what happens. So we diminish the value of the whole. We turn something that ought to be beautiful, that ought to be bringing development and, you know, many positive things, we turn it into something that's incredibly destructive. So simply speaking, you might say that's the cause of conflict, but let's, let's try and explore it a little bit more. And this is a very interesting point. I'm gonna, after this slide, I'm gonna, I think the next one is some interesting religious quotations. And in a sense, we were, you know, when uh, we were talking about um, putting the world to rights and creating influence, you know, towards powerful and important people. Um, the reality is all human beings are involved in an internal battle. And religion points to this very strongly and identifies that although we have 
a, a good nature, a godly nature, a Buddha nature, whatever you want to call it, we have another nature, which means we have a, a, a vulnerability, a weakness to head in a direction that's self-centered and that we blind ourselves and even convince ourselves we're doing something good when actually we're actually doing it for ourselves. We have a, a misplaced motivation. So um, the implication here, and many religions would, would recognize this, is that we do have a, a godly nature, uh, or an ideal, or a true nature, or we do have a nature that seeks, uh, that feels a natural inclination to live for others, or feels drawn to a high moral code, and in this we've called this the original nature. Um, you know, our, you might say our God-given nature. But that tends to be surrounded by another nature which is more developed than this one. And why is it more developed? Because the reality is human history has been more full of wrong conduct than it has a good conduct. So not surprisingly, when people have done a lot of bad things, through having wrong interaction between their mind and body and between each other, they've generated a lot of elements which have damaged them and you know, enable them to develop a mind which more readily thinks of my benefit regardless of God and others than does of you know, what's good for God and others. Surely our capitalist culture that we're living in is also developing that selfish nature as well. Sure, 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 sure. So, so what's the fundamental function of all good religion, you know, when it's operating, is seeking to expand this one and diminish this one. Mm. So they all talk about the inner battle, you know, and how you govern yourself, such you develop your goodness and diminish your inclination to behave very selfishly. This is, this is very, very important. So um, these are just a few quotations, right? Uh, oh. oh no, it's died again. No. Did that happen? that one? I've, I've edited my slides and maybe it'll come up at the end, it does. <laughs> so I'm trying to make sure I've got quotations from things which I think are representative of all of you because there's so many different religions to choose from. So starting off with the added grounds. Whoever proclaims himself good, no. Goodness approaches him not. not. <laughs> so if you say how good I am, <laughs> in all good. probability, you are not very good at all. <laughs> or from Hinduism, the mind is twofold, the pure and also the impure. Well, this is interesting. This is from Native American religions, the Mohawk tradition. Every person has both a bad heart and a good heart. Or from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, stunning statement, I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I is do. What I do. Wow. Amazing. Oh split. What a stupid way. <laughs> How can you be so stupid? Because split. The reality is human conduct is such that we all demonstrate our stupidity in this way. So that's, you know, there, there would be many, many more uh, insightful statements from scripture, because this is the very core of understanding what religion is about. Religion's fundamental target in terms of seeking peace for the individual is to help me to recognize what is my goodness and expand and develop it and help me to recognize what is my selfishness, my wrong attitude, my wrong conduct, and diminish, 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 diminish it. And where that, where that works well, religion has been a huge assistance to develop civilization in a positive direction. And you can see where that's happened. You, there are golden periods, you know, in the history of civilization where religion has been functioning well and uplifted society. You know, when I was a, a student in Leicester University, I was, my principal subject was economic history. And, you know, you inevitably, of course, study economic history in Britain, you've got to study the Industrial Revolution, right? So one very important aspect of the Industrial Revolution was the work ethic. Mm. And this was the Protestant work ethic. And if you go up there to the, the north of England, for example, you look at all those mill towns, and you see the Methodist and the Baptist chapels. 
you know, where there was a new type of religion, which wasn't a religion for the elite, but a religion that went to, to the grassroots and to the working people, it encouraged them in the direction of self-development and taking a pride in their work and being people of their word. And very, very interesting, all those sorts of things were there. So it can have, you know, the right application of religion has a very positive impact in those sorts of ways in uplifting society. This is an interesting picture, right? You know, in a sense, this is your eye. <laughs> what does it mean? It means there's a, there's a nature within me, as we said, which leads me in, in, a, in a godly direction, in a direction of feeling a natural inclination to, to do generous things for other people, and another nature that put, places myself ahead of everybody else. And there's a battle that's going on inside. So, you know, there's a battle in the mind of each person which manifests as conflict in the family, the society, and the world. It's the root of it, in a sense. So, if we can sort ourselves out, or, of course, best thing would be, I mean, let's, let's do it like that. Just Mr. Obama and Mr. Cameron and Mr. Putin and a few of us, they have to sort themselves out. And then we'll all be okay. We don't really have to do anything, do we? <laughs> We're not significant or important. Well, unfortunately, you know, that's a big cop-out, isn't it? So it would be good if all those influential people became better people. Mm. But anyhow, what's the starting point? At least the starting point is to me trying to deal with myself. So, so how, do, how do I develop myself? Through unselfish thoughts, words, and actions, I develop my good side. Through evil, selfish thoughts, words, and actions, I develop my bad side. And what's, you know, there's, a, there's many dimensions of this, but this type of conduct tends to be more to do with immediate, <coughs> short-term benefit for myself. Mm -hmm. And we say, therefore, more body-dominated. What does this mean? It means tends to be more materialistic. It tends to be, how can I get something immediately now to fill my emptiness and make me happy, make me feel better. But in the long term, it's nearly always disastrous, right? Whereas this one is much more eternal. I put here mind led. It means, I mean your good mind, not your bad mind, obviously. I mean your godly mind, your moral mind, your higher purpose mind influences you to behave in this way. And if you behave in that way a long time, do you remember the, the balance between God's responsibility and human responsibility? So God, you know, created an amazing world and God placed in this world religious founders, scriptures, teachings through which we can gain benefit. But you can have all of that, but if you don't fulfill your responsibility, it's not going to benefit you very much. What's your responsibility? It's to put into practice in your own life and get good vitality elements through which you substantially grow as a human being and develop the good side of yourself. So to have this awareness, to be able to make this judgment in my life, you know, as a young person, and you're faced with certain I remember when I was a young person, I, my, my, I, there were two sons in my family. We were friends with another family where there were two sons. And uh, my brother was the oldest, and then the oldest brother of the other family was the next one, and then I was younger than him, and then his younger brother was younger than me. And there was one point in which, uh, well, first of all, we did, we did everything together. And then later on, I got into a situation where this boy was a little bit older than me, just he and me together. And he wasn't a bad person, but, you know, he led me towards certain things. <laughs> and to go. very nearly I got really messed up by it. I remember the day he took me out to the chemist and we bought the dry cleaning fluid. And he said, it's very interesting to sniff this dry cleaning fluid. Oh. And you know, fortunately, I didn't dry clean my brains. But <laughs> I could have headed in that That's serious stuff, right? Yeah, serious yeah. stuff. And there's a number of other things as well. And, you know... It's possible to, to get influence to go in the wrong direction, so in life, uh, very, very easily happens. Okay, so I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to look at um, an insight into this whole issue of origin of conflict and what you might call clues that are there in the, the, the stories and the background which are involved in our religious traditions and beliefs. And some people might say, well, that's not very scientific or, or whatever. But actually, we can find very profound insights. Because when you think about it, isn't it extraordinary that religious teachings that may be thousands of years old, still today, people with their, you know, their iPhones and their internets, 
can return to those insights and practice them and find enormous wisdom and personal peace and resolution and solutions. It's, it's still possible. So we should not discount things as just being somehow mythologies or ancient or whatever, when down the course of history they've been very, provided very meaningful insights. So there's a couple of images there, right? Who's this? Pandora. Pandora, yeah. This is the, the Greek mythology of the, the woman who opened the box, right? And the, all evil escaped out of it. And of course, this is what? This is Adam and Eve. Anyhow, there are many such, in many, many traditions, culturally and religiously, there's stories about how evil began. You know, very interesting stories, very insightful stories. So, so this is the Judeo-Christian Muslim of origin story, as it were, which is present in the biblical record and the Quranic record. This is the Adam and Eve story, and uh, you know the serpent and the fruit and so on. And this is also the next. So they are cast out for some reason, which is, you know, not immediately apparent, maybe, from the story. And then in the next generation, the elder son kills the younger son. So you've got something going on there, which has a connection, obviously, to something beyond fruit. And the implication here is it has a, it has a, a reflection upon uh, sexual relationships in that area. And you have then in the next generation something which is to do with murder. So, you know, two very grave areas of misconduct, if you like, of misusing give and take action, and having relationships with one another which are abusive, violent, damaging, this sort of area. Anyhow, let me just... Um, I'll put them all up. Again, just a selection of vocations, which are very, very um, strong on the whole issue of interpersonal relationships, particularly in the area of love and sexuality and marriage. And uh, if you remember the previous presentation I gave about the family, you might understand then, you know, you can understand clearly why this might be a very important area not to make a violation. Because the world is full of what some people will call sin, or other people might call exploitive or abuse, abusive relationships. And they don't have to be sexual, obviously. You know, I, can, I can steal Margaret's handbag, or I can you? You know, bash her in the face, or I can do all sorts of things which are abusive. And you know, me imposing my will and desire on someone else in a way that damages them, and which is not a true relationship. But, of course, because this place that men and women meet in love determines the quality of love that passes to the next generation, it is extraordinarily influential and is a, a key, if you like, to creating a world of peace and lasting happiness. So, um, from, from Hinduism, it's better to die than in, indulge in partaking of forbidden lustful pleasure. And from Buddhism, the man who goes to the wife of another digs up the very roots of life. And from Islam, do not come near adultery, for it is a shameful deed and evil, opening the road to other evils. And from the New Testament, Christianity, flee from sexual immorality. He who sins sexually sins against his own body. So in our you know, modern culture, we're maybe getting quite you know, careless or you know, casual about these sorts of things because we want experience, we want love, we want to test it out, we want to try it out, and all sorts of things which may not be completely bereft of meaning, but taken on their own without you know, other things that guide us in the right direction. They're extraordinarily damaging. So, um, all the great religious traditions have been very particular to encourage people towards the seriousness of making proper commitments and the damage that is caused by making self-centered, careless experiments, you know, with, with, with love and sexual relationships. So if you like, you could put in the context of the diagram we used before. So uh, in all relationships, not just in the marriage relationship, if one person is relating to another person, or one person is relating to a thing, or a property, or whatever, centering on a self-centered purpose, and with an exploitative motivation, using the other, not understanding there's a precious gift from God that should be respected and related to in a way that's pleasing to the Creator and according to the Creator's original purpose of love, but rather just using that thing or that person for myself, 
Therefore, this meeting place is not the substantiation of the love of God or the purpose of the Creator, but it's the substantiation of you know, selfishness and evil. And then the result that that brings out in terms of life's experiences and developments, in terms of the relationship between these two people. So before children come into being, of course, you've got the couple. So many painful, hurtful, abusive, unhappy things can be experienced through this interaction. And then, of course, also the result that comes out is affected by that. So, again, this can sound extraordinarily judgmental and depressive. So I don't want you to take it like that. But, you know, what it's expressing to us is it's very serious how we interact with one another. Mm -hmm. And the consequences that it brings. <coughs> and at their worst, you can, you know, you, if you go into the world of children who've come out of, I mean, I've worked for, several, for half a year in a, um, a therapeutic community where there are about 12 kids from uh, very abusive backgrounds who couldn't be placed with foster families because their behavior was just too challenging and too disturbed and too, too damaged. And we needed a very large staff and a lot of very high level professional input to try and stabilize these children so that we could place them in, in specialist foster families. And I remember the first time I went to visit this place, it was actually part of my social work studies placement. I went to visit this place, and these gorgeous looking lovely kids. And you know, to begin with, I didn't understand anything was wrong. And then I ended up doing my work placement there, and then working in there afterwards. And their behavior was so unbelievably difficult. You know, little 10 year old girls trying to sexually seduce you, apparently. Little boys who, no, 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 very serious stuff, very serious stuff. Good heavens. Because of, you know, the way that they've been treated, the, the sexualized behavior that they learned. And little boys, you know, who um, had big problems about going to the toilet and wiping their bottom, and there was some background behind that which was involved with that, and who would pick up chairs and smash windows, you know, and needed three staff members to hold them down. And, you know, incredible stuff going on. And, thousands upon thousands of pounds every week to try and stabilize these children so you can place them in specialist foster placements. And incredible consequences. So not everything's at that strict stream, of course, but you can understand if you turn this into another model, you get a very different type of result. And this goes for all, you know, relationships. So false, instead of true love, true parents, a true life coming out of true love, if you like, and a true lineage, then you get a very different situation. Uh, so again, let's be honest with ourselves, we've all done less than the best, but in a sense it's not entirely surprising, because we've come from a background which in itself has been, you know, not ideal at all. Uh, but we want to make it better, so having an insight about these things, understanding their seriousness can be very helpful, in doing better the next time round, or helping our children or society to go in a better direction. So, if you think about what's the root cause of conflict, I would say it's clear. The origin of the issue is, first of all, the separation between, between the individual, or you might say people at large, and God, or a moral understanding, or a sense of higher purpose. So, if you don't have that connection, and that awareness, and you're not sort of encouraged to understand on that level, then it's not surprising if you conduct yourself just thinking of my own need. Or, again, um, this doesn't, you know, this applies to all human beings. You know, no one is above this reality. So I was telling you about this 30, 40 year old, 40 years of Christian ministry, and then getting exhausted and sick and reflecting and realizing that part of his motivation was to search for. A recognition of his own value. I mean, but that doesn't mean that that's just an evil, bad man. Do you understand? Of course he's not. But he's dealing with this contradiction that we're all dealing with. That we have a, a godly nature, but we have another nature. And some people say there's even another force of evil, you know, which is developing that nature. So the first, the root cause of all conflict is a separation between my uh, life and that source of wisdom and love and you know sense of higher purpose. So we need, we need that, and when we get cut off from that, what happens as a result of that? 
we have conflict at the individual level. What does this mean? It means instead of my higher purpose moral mind being in control of my body, or my spiritual side, which tends to be more aware of the whole purpose or the well-being of others, or be em empathetic or understanding of others, is dominated by more, my more immediate, more materially orientated desires. Do you understand? So, you know, how is it possible that... It's always in the news, isn't it? Yeah. Some guy who's been, you know, the, the deputy headmaster of an expensive public school for many, many years, and everybody thought he was a lovely guy, and suddenly it's discovered he's been taking secret movies of the kids in the showers and the changing rooms, and, you know, he's got all this stuff on his computer. And, you know, how on earth is that possible? How on earth is that possible? But somehow, you know, <coughs> he's been affected by this. Or, you know, I live in Sussex. <laughs> and the history of the Church of England in Sussex has been a little bit difficult these last... Because there are a couple of bishops who are both now, you know, condemned paedophiles. You know, isn't it extraordinary? I don't for a moment imagine they never had any goodness. Or they never had any good aspect of themselves. But they got themselves into a situation where they ended up doing extraordinarily abusive things and apparently permitting other people to do it too. So, you know, what is this about? It's where, and that's very extreme expression of it, of course, but, but in other words, you lose your connection to God, you lose your connection to a sense of higher purpose, you lose your moral compass, and then what tends to happen is you start doing things which are more self-centered, more orientated to your immediate material satisfaction, and which are betraying your godly mind. You know, it's, it's, the next, it's the next thing that breaks down. If you like. And then, of course, that has a consequence. Because from that individual level conflict, then you inevitably have a conflict happening with the people around you. So, you know, if you, if you are... are you know, when you're standing there in front of the priest and you're solemnizing your marriage and you're committing yourself to the other person, I will love you no matter what, you know, in sickness and health, for all my life long until death has to part, you may mean it from your better nature. But maybe, you know, weeks later, months later, years later, there may emerge something very different from that, which is very cruel and maybe violent, uh, abusive, you know, uh, betrayal of the other person. Because you have another nature. So, you know, if you if you practice life in such a way that you betray your yourself by not keeping those those uh, moral imperatives or that higher purpose standard, then inevitably you become a not very desirable husband or wife or brother or sister or or you know peer or employee to your employer or employer to your employee. And it's very difficult to keep the standard, isn't it? If, you know, if, um, um, if, if someone in your society is conducting themselves out of her, an habitual pattern of, of abusive, exploitative conduct, and you discover about it, and you're going to be the whistleblower, or you're going to be the person who tries to set a different trend, you, you're going to have to go a pretty difficult path, right? Because if you're standing against all the you know, long established wrong conduct. And that's, that's a very difficult one to do. So you can see how these, you know, breaking the relationship with God, breaking the proper control of my own conduct, and then becoming an irresponsible relationship, person in relationship, even with the people that I want to love and that I want to treat well. So I think it would be, it would be very unlikely that parents who are abusive to their own children only have abusive thoughts to their own children. It's very probable that in another aspect they have, a, you know, they have something which is wanting the best for their children. But then maybe they get into a pattern of, you know, misconduct, and then it's they get so tied up and complicated and messed up in their own thinking. You know, it's, it's a really difficult situation. So, so the root cause of conflict then breaking the relationship with God, losing. Um, control of my own conduct and tending to follow more my immediate self-centered desires, being an irresponsible person in, in, in interpersonal relationships. So, in other words, you know, it's just as things should build from individual peace to family societal peace to universal peace, so they can build the other way. So if people are 
developing themselves in, in a wrong way through uh, being in a society where wrong practice is normal. I mean, presumably in the world of banking or you know whatever it was, there was certain conduct which was going on which was regarded as the norm, mm -hmm. and people assumed it was okay to do it. And then to turn it around is very difficult. We we just heard on the news the other day that drug taking is endemic in Russian athletics and possibly other places too. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, and you know, when when it's like that, it's difficult to escape it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you know, the, the influence develops from this level to this level to this level. So in this sense, we're trying to grasp what's the origin of conflict and how it develops and expands. And then that leads us to think about how do we resolve it? Well, we want to strengthen the connection between the individual and higher values or morality or God. And we want to restore the proper relationships between human beings. So we could talk about strengthening the heart and conscience, if you like. And we talk about loving the enemy or, or putting our relationships right. You know. And who's the most likely person to put the relationship right? Many times it's not necessarily the abuser. If the abused can understand what's gone wrong, they may have the opportunity to put it right. So Patricia's story this morning about a lady whose child was killed by someone else, but then who's seeing them now feels enormous compassion, mm. remembers all the history and background that would explain why they did what they did and why there was so much racial hatred involved in that, bursts into tears and then something <coughs> very different emerges from it. That's the process of, if you like, putting it right. That's a, a living example of it. Anyhow, here's a quotation from uh, UNESCO's preamble uh, in the Constitution. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defense of peace must be constructed. Absolutely. Some women might also draw other conclusions from that, as you notice it mentions men. And there's a lot of talk about that as well, and the need for women to be involved in all sorts of different levels of governance. This was the... This is um, Dag Hammarskjöld, one of the... Uh, the second UN Secretary General, who was actually a very spiritual because, as you know, he mm -hmm. died in an aircraft accident. I see no hope for permanent world peace. We have tried and failed miserably. Unless the world has a spiritual rebirth, civilization is doomed. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate solution is within myself. Mm -hmm. uh, because even if I became this influential person that was moving around with the Bill Gates of this world, I have to make darn sure I don't become... Of course, he's probably a pretty good guy because he's giving it all away, right? Yeah. But, I mean, if I get involved with powerful, influential people but I can't maintain my own goodness, I can't defend myself against that misconduct, then I'm just going to get sucked into that instead of changing it. So this is very, very important. So religion has a role to play, and I think you'll find, if you think about your own religious traditions and backgrounds... Of course, there are many sad, unfortunate, bad things that happen in religious history. But we, when we think about where religion is operating properly, its fundamental function is, to, as I said, to develop the goodness within you and diminish the tendency towards selfish, careless, you know, unaware of other people and God type of thoughts and feelings. So think about religious practices and the things that religion, true religion upholds. So all true religion would ask us to search for humility. Humility in front of God, respect for parents, fidelity in marriage, loyalty in human relationships, and an attitude of public service. Now that's all good stuff, right? Mm. Now that's not to say that all religion is always true to that, but that is, in essence, a very important part of religious teaching. Or, or having personal discipline, being able to control myself so I don't just follow my self-centered inclination, being able to sacrifice, being able to control my physical desires so I'm not lustful, I'm not greedy, I'm not, you know, uh, being led by my body as it were. Having restraint, having patience, being able to forgive others, um, loving others as you yourself uh, would wish to be treated, or, you know, this is what they call the golden rule, right? Mm -hmm. Present in all the great religious traditions. Do to others as you would wish to have done yourself. <coughs> love others as you love yourself. And love your neighbor, and even love your enemy. So these sorts of very high values, very 
difficult things to maintain and do, this is the fundamental responsibility and mission of religion, is to work towards increasing individual peace and individual closeness to God, which will inevitably impact uh, the relationship that those individuals have with other people and can be the seed of bringing great change in the world. So if you think about incidents in human history where sometimes even peace is brought about, it can sometimes be the action of just one individual in forgiving the enemy, which actually brings about great change. I could go into stories about that, but I won't. I'm going to lose my time completely if I do, so I won't. Um, the, in, the, in the thinking of the Universal Peace Federation, we talk about a process which in a sense is very common sense and very obvious. If, for example, you're an honest human being, that was your original position, and you, tell a, you make a deception or you tell a lie, even to someone that you love or you have a, a big commitment to, you become a liar. So how are you going to recover the loss of your integrity? from being an honest person to becoming a liar. What's the process? Of course the process is hide your life, you know, and don't let the other person know about it and everything will be okay. That's the right process. No, 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 no. Well that's apparently the simpler process, right? And that's the, that's the course of action that most people seek to follow, right? But actually it doesn't bring a resolution. Strangely, the resolution is that you don't um, hide the secret, you actually expose the secret and you come and you explain what you've done wrong and that's a very fearful process many times that's why many times to have the strength to do it you need to reconcile yourself with God before you can reconcile yourself with the person um, you know that gives you the strength to do it so it's a sort of reverse process so if you've been dishonest and become a liar then the way to put it right is you have to be honest and explain about your own misconduct so reading that book from that, uh, that minister in Birmingham, who had been 30 years a minister, he talked about being in love with the church more than he was with his wife and having a mistress. But in the next chapter he went on to an occasion when he was doing his ministerial work and he saw a lady and he felt a very powerful attraction to her. This was real mistress stuff. Oh my God. And then fortunately he said, I had very good friends in the ministry and I discussed it with one of my friends and he advised me, you better say something to your wife. And I said something to my wife, and immediately all that stuff just whoosh, it went away. And I was released from it. And I didn't get myself into a, a very compromised position where I went against all my own beliefs and my love for my wife and my family. So, you know, this, this process of getting yourself back to the, the, the good status you've lost, this is usually a, a reversal course. It's to go the opposite way to, the, to what you've already done. Um, and it's to take responsibility uh, for your misconduct by taking actions to correct the flaws, the weaknesses, and the bad habits that you've, you've manifested in your own conduct. So, of course, it, it requires realization. It requires you to understand what you've done wrong. Very often when people have done wrong things, you know, what's, what's their response if they're accused of their wrong action? You know, if someone accuses you, you've done something wrong, what do they say? Usually it's, you know, yes, okay, well maybe I did, but it's because of this, and it's because of that, it's because of him, because of her, and the way I was treated that way, and so on, and so on, and so on. So in other words, there's a lack of a capacity to, to understand my own position and my own responsibility. So this whole process has to start with that understanding. And we could get very deep into thinking about this process of you know, repentance or self-realization and then uh, feeling sorry to God and other people, not sorry for yourself, but sorry to God and other people and putting it right. So what we're suggesting is the first way to put it right is actually you have to get right with the higher purpose. You have to get right with the moral standard. Or if you want to put it that way, you have to get right with God. So self-reflection, prayer, meditation, Doing something to say to God, I want to, I want to express my um, repentance for my misconduct. I want to offer something to you. I want to do something good for other people. I want to change my conduct. I want to be pleasing to you instead of betraying you. 
um, studying you know, scriptural truths, putting yourself under the instruction of a, a, um, someone who can guide you in the right direction, confessing to such a person. All these sorts of practices have been the traditional practices. So if you've misconducted yourself in terms of sexual infidelity, you might seek a period of sexual purity or celibacy or, you know, um, if you misuse money, you might seek to be very generous in giving. His, you know, you probably remember that biblical story, Christ, the tax, the tax collector, and, and what the tax collector ends up giving, what was it, six times more back to the people who he cheated. And, and then, you know, Jesus was, uh, isn't it great, forgiveness has come to this house today because of that conduct. So undoing and putting right and paying a price to put yourself right in front of God, leading to what? The next step clearly is actually, um, here's some quotations first of all. Um, from Islam, let evil be rewarded by like evil. Maybe it doesn't sound such a promising statement in light of what we've been talking about, but it moves on. But he who forgives and seeks reconciliation shall be rewarded by God. Why? Because God does not love the wrongdoers. But true constancy lies in forgiveness and patient forbearance. This should be read a lot, right, at the moment, in order to get the right attitude and really learn from Bahamut's core teaching. Or from Christianity, if you're offering your gift at the altar, if you're trying to give an offering to God, to be pleasing to God, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. And first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Or from Sikhism, where there is forgiveness, there is God himself. So holding up forgiveness, right? Um, because usually, you know, when we've misconducted ourselves, there, there's hurt and pain in interpersonal human relationships. So from getting right with God and reconnecting myself with higher values, the next step inevitably is to get right in the relationships with other people that I've hurt or that have hurt me or that I'm blaming for my misconduct or whatever. And doing things to restore my own and take responsibility for my own wrong conduct by reversing it and doing something uh, that undoes my wrong conduct, either directly with the person involved, or as a step towards that maybe in terms of doing good things for other people. 